John, uh, John's being really kind about that, truthfully. I called him and I said, hey, I'm gonna be in town, can I preach? Which felt a little forward of me to do that. My wife was like, what if he doesn't want you to do that? And I'm like, he'll say he doesn't want me to do that. You know what I mean? So this is kind of how it works. I really feel grateful. Thanks for accepting my forward invitation. Um, we came in town, uh, my uh, 10-year-old, nine-year-old son, my brother-in-law, his 10-year-old son, we went to the game yesterday. Um, amazing experience, Madison, this area is absolutely amazing. I see so much Packers gear. I, my, um, I grew up, my, my parents are big Alabama people, and so they were big Bart Starr fans, and so I grew up a Packers fan, which was fun to see all of that. And I guess you, you woke up this morning and probably had to be thinking, I am, God, I'm so glad you didn't make me a Bears fan. Is that the way? I would just think that's the way I would feel if I were in your shoes. Um, I, um, we, everywhere we've gone, I feel like we've tried to really experience your culture here. Uh, we've certainly ordered cheese curds at every meal. I don't know if every meal should, um, is supposed to have fried cheese, but it feels like it should. I feel like you guys are nailing it on that for sure. We did the fr Friday night fish fry. That was an absolute blast. The only, um, the only hiccup we've had yesterday at the game, these dudes that were sitting down the row from us, they were like just large fellas. And uh, I, you know, I was like just trying to be as kind and not trying to fight anybody for sure. I don't. You might look at me and tell, like, yeah, that's probably a good move for you. Not trying to, not trying to get any kind of scuffle, you know. Plus, seven nice father son time. But I, I, uh, I ate one of your brats. I think it was like the seventeenth one I've had since I've been here. Delicious. And I balled up my paper and just kind of threw it behind me because we're at a football game, right? And uh, I noticed that it came right back to me. I was like, okay, that's weird. Anyway, so I grabbed it, threw it again, and I saw the guy, he looked at me, and he threw it back at me, and he goes, we'd never do that in your place, and I was like, I, really? Like, you wouldn't? Because when the game was over, it looked like the starter kit to a landfill. Like, there was so much trash in the stadium. I was like, it feels like that's what you just do, but I was like, hey, sir, no problem at all. So I took the trash and just put it in my pocket, and I threw it away when the game was over, like any good citizen would do. So I respect your level of cleanliness as well, very high. No, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, you guys are, uh, the people have been just so cool, so nice, so hospitable. It's been absolutely awesome. We've had a blast. Um, today I want to talk about being obsessed with things. Anybody obsessed? You might be obsessed with your sports team. You might be obsessed with your hobby. You might be sitting by somebody that you're obsessed with. Hey, I am certainly obsessed with my wife. Uh, we have five children, and whenever we go somewhere, people are like, do you know how that happens? And the truth is, she's obsessed with me. So she can't keep her hands off of me. Uh, I just want to talk at the end of the day, want to have a good conversation, and she just is not having it. I'm like, I'm not a body. I'm a person. I'm a soul. I want to hear what you're feeling and what you're thinking and what's going on in your mind, and she's just not having it. So we all, I think we all can relate. We all know what it's like to be obsessed with something, maybe even to be obsessed with someone. But today I want to talk about one of the things that we all have in common, and that is that we all know what it's like to be obsessed with something that you didn't get, right? But I, I wonder, is it harder sometimes to be obsessed with something that you then do get, and then it doesn't fulfill, right? Right? Like some of you maybe are working in a job right now that like it was your hope and dream to get this job. Some of you were hoping so badly to be married and you got married and look straight forward. Do not look to your left or your right right now, but just blink if you know what I'm talking about. The person next to you is like, it's not, he, he, my, it took my wife about a day for her to realize this guy ain't going to meet all my needs. Like this guy cannot do it, will not do it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have it in me to meet all your needs and to be everything that you ever hope that I can be. But I'm gonna try to do it. I'm gonna try my whole life to do it, but I just know we can't do that for each other. Maybe you got married and all you wanted was kids and then it didn't work out for you. Maybe you haven't had kids. What's even worse though is you had kids and you're like, yeah, it, it didn't do, like it, I mean, we love them, but like it's not, it's not meeting all of our needs, right? Like Mother's Day, this always blows my mind. You know what my wife wants for Mother's Day every year? To be alone, that is exactly right. And our kids can't understand that. They're like, we're the ones that made you be able to celebrate this day. And she's like, I know, and you're the last people I wanna see on this day, right? 
It's just the way it works. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what happens to a life that is obsessed with the wrong thing. What happens to a life that is obsessed with something that you never get and you're kind of just living with that broken dream or worse? What happens to a life that's obsessed with something that you get and it doesn't fulfill, it doesn't meet your needs and it's kind of left you wanting, kind of left you wondering, what now? And we're going to look at this story. John said I could preach on anything I wanted to preach on. And some of you, are, you're going to hear this story and you're going to be like, and that's what you chose? Like, this is the weirdest, most bizarre story. You pick pretty much any story in the Old Testament and you're going to find some real odd stuff, right? I mean, these people put the fun and dysfunctional for sure. I mean, bizarre story. We're going to talk about a guy named Jacob. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Genesis 29. If you don't have one with you, no worries at all. We're going to put it up on the screen. But Genesis 29 picks up kind of in the middle of Jacob's life. And Jacob's a storied character in the Old Testament. He's a really interesting guy. His name in and of itself tells us a little bit about him. His name means the striver. He's always like reaching for something, hoping to get it, that it might meet all his needs, right? And, and, he, and, and we see that early in his life. Does anybody know um, what his brother's name was? Anybody remember Jacob's brother, Jacob and Esau? Yeah, whoever said that on your row, when you're playing Bible trivia on Friday night, you're gonna wanna be on their team, okay? He had a dad named Isaac. Isaac's on his deathbed, right? You might remember this story. Isaac's on his deathbed. He's going blind. He's about to die. And Jacob, the striver, is about to steal the birthright from his brother Esau. Pretty smooth move that he does here, right? You remember his strat, as the kids say, his strategy was to put on some, uh, some like camel's fur because his brother Esau was evidently like the hairiest human on the planet, right? I don't know how the beach was for this guy, but he had to be like a confident fella to take his shirt off at the beach. I mean, everybody was just like, whoa, Esau, right? I mean, if your dad is grabbing your arm and is like, is that a camel or is that my son, right? You know you're a hairy fella, but that was his strategy. His dad's dying. His dad reaches out and says, who is this? And Jacob goes, it's Esau. And he goes, oh, let me feel you. And he feels his arm and goes, yeah, it must be Esau. And Jacob steals his birthright. And now he's on the run because his brother wants to murder him. His brother's not happy about it. And Jacob's burnt the bridges on that side of the family. And so he goes over to his mother's side of the family. He's got an uncle named Laban. And he's in search of Laban because Laban evidently was like that rich uncle that you have that you're hoping, you know, is either going to pass his money down to you or he maybe even will hire you and give you like some kind of like cush job, right? That's what he's looking for. And so he goes to this town. That's where we're going to pick up Genesis 29 verse 4. And he bumps into these shepherds and he asked these guys, he says, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. And he's like, perfect, because my guy Laban's from Haran. And so he says, do you know Laban? He's Nahor's grandson. And they go, yeah, we know him. And so Jacob's just making small talk with him. And he's like, well, how's he doing? And they're like, oh, he's doing well. And then look at this. In fact, here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. Okay. Now, some of you are like, why does any of that matter? Because what do we know about Rachel? Some of you that have heard this story before, what do we know about Rachel? She's pretty. Yeah, somebody in the back was like, she's hot, bro, right? Like, she's gorgeous. She's fire. Like, I don't know how the kids would say that these days, but she's beautiful. And so you get the scene. Jacob's, like, got his sunglasses on. He, like, lowers his sunglasses, you know? Like, he's Matthew McConaughey, like, looking at her being like, Oh my goodness, this girl is amazing. The music from Shaft is playing in the background. Bow, chicka, bow, wow, right? This is the moment where he takes that thing inside of him that is looking for something to fill his dreams and, and meet, his, meet all of his expectations and his hopes and make him feel valuable and worthy and something, and he now fixates on this girl, right? That's never happened to anyone in this room, but you might be able to imagine that happening kidding, right? Everybody can relate to that. And he looks at her and he goes, ah, oh, she's the one. And so he's already kind of conniving. He's already thinking like, how am I going to do this? And so he's thinking maybe if I'll work for Laban, maybe I could get Rachel. But that's, that's a little uh, unorthodox because the way things would work is you'd go with the older sister first. And so Laban is kind of trying to figure this out. And Laban's Maybe he's heard about Jacob. Maybe he knows, like, Jacob, is, he's the kind of guy that can get stuff done. And so he asks him, he says, just because you're a relative of mine, Laban says, should you just work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. 
And so we're in the midst of this negotiation on what he's going to do to work for his uncle to try to get the thing that he hopes that he could really find. When the author zooms out and the author goes, now you got to know a little bit about this situation because it wasn't just Rachel. What do we know? There's somebody else on the scene, right? Rachel's got a sister. Anybody remember his sister, her sister's name? Leah, yeah. And Leah was the older sister. And so the author's going, hey, 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 before you just think this is like an easy, like, you know, uh, turnkey kind of deal, like it's not because it's complicated because you don't marry off the, old, the younger child first, you marry it off the older child. And, and so the author tells us this. He says Laban had two daughters. The name of the older daughter was Leah and the name of the younger daughter was Rachel. And some of you earlier when I said, what do you know about Rachel? And you're like, oh, she's beautiful. Others of you were like, well, how'd you know that? Well, because the author tells us that. He explains to us that it's complicated. Like, this is a tricky situation. And you're gonna read this next phrase and you're gonna be like, I'm sorry, what? Because it doesn't exactly make sense, but there is something about this figure of speech that gives us the explanation and the context that we need to be able to understand the difference between Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel. The author tells us this. He says, Leah, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Is that as confusing to you as it was to me when I first read it? I'm like, what does that even mean? Leah has weak, because we all passed fourth grade, right? And so we all know the way a contrasting sentence works. You start with a statement and then you say, but, or however, and then you make the opposite statement, right? And so contextually, if I were to tell you Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had, you would say strong eyes or like, yo, know, that girl had 20-20 vis, like she could see forever. Like, I mean, yes, the sheep were with her, but she's like, she could see the ones that were a long way away as well. Like she could see from here to Madison. Like she, she had such good eyesight, right? No, that's not what this is about because look at what they contrast it with. The author says she had weak eyes, but Rachel was, had a lovely figure and was beautiful, which makes you realize maybe, just maybe, he's not talking about Leah's eyes. See, the commentators disagree about this. Some of the, some of the commentators say like, no, she actually like had some kind of eye disformity or had some kind of eye problem. But others are like, no, 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 it's just a way of explaining that she just wasn't as beautiful as her sister was, right? Because if I were to ask you, I said, hey, what do you know about Rachel? You all were like, oh, she's pretty. But if I were to say, what do you know about Leah? You would go, she's got a good personality, right? Like that's just the way things work. And just so you know, I'm not trying to poke fun at Leah. Some people get real protective. I feel very protective of Leah. In fact, this story makes me feel uncomfortable in some ways because you read the story and this story has some incredibly awful overtones to it. We have hints of, not hints, we have direct polygamy in the story. We certainly have sexism in the story. We see the objectification of women in the story. We see hints of slavery in the story. And nowhere do I read the story and go, the author's trying to let us know this was awesome. No, the author is trying to let us know these are broken systems that do not work, that do not lead to human flourishing. No, it's devaluing to humans. It's not helpful to each other. It's harmful and hurtful to each other. And so though we might poke fun of the fact that Leah had weak eyes, it's really an awful explanation. But since we're all friends here, can I just dip it to some sarcasm for just a second? Aren't you glad that we live in a society that has advanced past the point where we might give somebody certain value just based on the way they look? Aren't you so grateful that we don't live in a world where someone just because they're more beautiful than others might have a better opportunity to get a job or might do better in an interview or might have a better shot of getting out of a speeding ticket just because they look better than others might look, right? I mean, obviously I'm kidding that we still do this. We still live in a culture that holds up certain values higher than others. And in this case, Laban's going, yeah, it's kind of worrisome to me because I've got a daughter that's beautiful and a daughter who's not, and I don't know what to do about the older one. And some of you have multiple kids, and though you would never say it, you can relate. Because you got that one child that you're like, 
he's, she's going to be fine. Like, we're not worried about her. Like, I mean, she's going to do great. And you got the other one that's like, I think she's going to be living with us when she's 40. Like, it's just that we're pretty confident about this. We're not sure how this is going to go. And you've never said it out loud, but you thought it. I, w- I did this wedding. I did this wedding about um, two years ago. And I'm only telling you, I, I, I would have never shared the story other than the fact that it came up in this moment. But this, this, um, this guy that I knew, a friend of mine, I'm at the age now where my, ki- my friend's children are getting married, which is a sobering reality. And a buddy of mine, John, wonderful guy, love the guy. He says, hey, my daughter's getting married. Would you officiate the wedding? I was like, sure. He's like, it's going to be in our backyard. I was like, love it. It's going to be great. you got a wonderful backyard. And uh, he, I met with a couple. They were delightful. I really enjoyed them. I didn't really know his daughter, so it was fun to meet her and be around her and meet her fiance. And he was great. She was great. It was wonderful. They were great. And I pull up to the wedding. I'll never forget this because he's stand, I have this mental image of him standing in his front yard waiting on me to get there in his tuxedo. And that's just an you know, odd thing to see somebody, I mean, where I'm from, you might see somebody peeing in their front yard, but you wouldn't see somebody standing in their front yard in a tuxedo, right? And so I pull up to his house. He's in this like super, you know, he's looking great. I'm like, John, you're looking amazing. It's great. I was like, are you so excited about today? And he goes, excited? I never thought this day would happen. <laughs> and I was like, that's a weird way to start a conversation about your daughter's wedding. But okay. I'm going to move past it. Let's act like that never happened. Let's try to re-engage, start this conversation over again. It got worse. He goes, no, here's how serious I am. And he holds up his arm, pulls down his coat sleeve, shows me his cufflink. On his cufflink was a pig with wings. Did you notice how there was like a little bit of delayed laughter? Because some of you, you didn't initially get it, and then you put it together and got it, and then some of you still haven't gotten it, so I'm going to break it down for you. What this man was saying is he was saying, I thought pigs would fly before this daughter got married. And some of you are like, that's just awful, and I would agree with you which is why I couldn't make eye contact with him the rest of the night. I was like, this is so awkward. Who says that about their own child? But he was just being honest. I never thought it would happen. She's a little awkward. He's a little awkward. They're perfect for each other. And I thought pigs would fly before she would get married. And Laban might have been thinking the same thing. He might have been thinking, I know it's going to be fine for Rachel. I don't know how it's going to work out for Leah. But Jacob, we get back to the negotiations, Jacob was in love with Rachel, that he goes, well, I'll do anything. I'll work for you for seven years. And anybody reading the story would have gasped because in that day, seven years would have been outlandish. One year would have been an appropriate amount to work for somebody in exchange to be able to marry their daughter. But you never want to throw the first number out in negotiations, right? You know that. That's like a good pro tip that a mentor taught me years ago. Let the other Yahoo throw out the first number. And Laban knew this, which is why he said, well, surely you're not going to work for me for free just because you're related to me. Tell me what your number is. But Jacob didn't care because he was madly in love. And he's looking for that thing that's going to fulfill him. And he says seven years. And Laban says something that's super awkward as well. He says, well, it's better I give her to you than some other man. Why don't you just stay here with me? Um, Fellas, if you ever go to your uh, future father-in-law and ask for his his daughter's hand in marriage, and he says to you, it's better that I give her to you than some other man, run, all right? Because that's not a great person that would say that. See, Jacob was conniving. Jacob was a striver. But in Laban, he has met his match. And so I'm going to fill in some of the details because I noticed that we have some children here and I don't want to make your car ride home awkward for you to have to explain how the wedding system in a long time ago would have worked. But the way it would have worked, I'll just tell you uh, in you know, adult-friendly terms, child-friendly terms, they would have had a big wedding and it would have been you know, like a multiple-day festive. I mean, it would have been like a, you know, they would have had like the Friday night party, the all-day Saturday party, the Sunday party. I mean, they would, have, they would have, they go hard at these weddings, okay? Alcohol was flowing. Everybody's like feasting, people coming in town for stuff. And then at the end of it all, there's a ceremony, and then there is a tent that they would have called the tent of consummation. And you can imagine what would happen in the tent of consummation. They would consummate the wedding, 
And so Jacob's in there. And you, you don't need anybody to explain this to you, but there was no electricity. So what was the vibe in the tent? It was quite dark and quiet, right? And he's in there waiting on his new bride, Rachel, to come in when Laban gets his two daughters together at the reception. And he says, Rachel, you're out. Leah, you're in. I don't know how those daughters handled that. I don't know if they were like, oh, that's funny, dad, hilarious. Like, what else, you know? I don't know if they just knew, like, oh, here our dad goes again, like trying to connive. But that had to be bewildering for Rachel, bewildering for Leah. But sure enough, Leah does what her dad asks her to do, and she goes into the tent. And think about this. Jacob reaches out and touches someone, thinking that it's someone else, and gets tricked. Does that sound familiar? See, I've wondered, why does Jacob not put up more of a fight? Why does he not go to Laban and demand that he do something different? Why does he just go along with it seemingly? I mean, look at what he says. The, the, the next verse, verse 24, 25 of chapter 29, the author says, when morning came, there was Leah. And so Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? And Maybe, just maybe, Laban looks at him and says, oh, I deceived you in the same way you deceived your dad? No, you got what's coming for you. Or maybe Jacob didn't put up much of an argument because he thought, I deserve this. I tricked my dad, and now I'm getting tricked. And so he renegotiates with Laban and says, well, I don't want to be married to Leah, but since it's already done, what do I got to do to be married to Rachel? And Laban says, well, seven more years, and you can be married to Rachel, to which he does. And in this story, we have these characters, and no one really gets what they want. Laban wanted to marry off his daughter, which he did, but now Leah's married to someone who doesn't want to be married to her. How miserable is that? And Genesis 29 goes on to tell us that you can see her misery in how she names her children. This is bizarre. But they would have named their child something that signified something that they were feeling in that moment. And she named her first son the Hebrew word that's the word for I see. And the author tells us she did that because she wanted somebody who saw her. She's married to someone who wouldn't even look at her. She's married to someone that didn't want to be with her. Second child names... Her second son, the, the word for I hear, I just want somebody to hear me. I want somebody to know that I'm here. I want somebody to know that I matter. Third son names her son the word for I want. I just want somebody to want me. I want to be wanted. I want to be with somebody who wants me. Meanwhile, Rachel does eventually get married to Jacob, but if you know the way the story goes, it's not like their relationship was perfect. As beautiful as she was, she knew that the main way that a woman in this culture brings value to the family is by what? By getting pregnant, by bringing a son into the world. And they struggled with infertility and she couldn't get pregnant. And so she's looking at her sister Leah going, yeah, it must be nice that I'm beautiful, but you at least can get pregnant. I can't get pregnant. So really, in the end, everybody's chasing something that they do not get. And here's what I think the main point of the story is. It's not just that God honors underdogs and God looks out for people that are forgotten. We're going to get there in a second. No, I think the real story is that true fulfillment in life is not about the chase. If you're chasing something today, just know it's not, life is not about chasing that thing that you think you want. No, life's about the, the grace that we receive when we finally turn to God. Because ultimately, Leah was the one who had to turn to God. Rachel was the one who had to turn to God in the midst of the, the situation that she was in that she couldn't control. And Jacob eventually turns to God. We don't really know if Laban does or doesn't, but I'm just telling you, in your situation, if you would allow your disappointment, allow your broken dream to cause you to turn and face God, I'm telling you, it is the only way to get through being obsessed with something that you get and doesn't fulfill or being obsessed with something that you never really get. That's where true fulfillment in life is found. Everything else is gonna leave you wanting. 
Which leads me to a question. In fact, I'm gonna ask you three questions. If you take notes, if you write stuff down, I'd love for you to write these three questions down. Maybe you'll, maybe just remember one. Maybe after your Packers get that big dub today, you think about, hey, maybe at dinner tonight, let's discuss this question, or tomorrow morning at breakfast, let's talk about this. But I'm gonna give you three of them. Here's the first one. What do we do with cosmic disappointment? What do we do with that level of disappointment that you go, this is so disappointing, it feels like God has done me wrong. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you are in the middle of it now. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That level of disappointment where you go, I wanted that job so bad and I didn't get it. Or I wanted that job so bad and I got it and then it didn't fulfill. I just wanted to get into the school. I just wanted to get married. We just wanted to have kids. We, we just wanted to have kids and then we had kids and now something's going on. Or we, we just wanted to have this happy life and now things keep interrupting it. What do you do with cosmic disappointment? I, I want to read you this quote. Uh, the font is fairly small, so hang with me. It's just two slides. But it's a quote from a, a book called Mere Christianity. A lot of you have probably heard of it, and some of you may have even read it. It's by an author named C.S. Lewis, very famous author. It's hard to preach a sermon without quoting C.S. Lewis. A remarkable, remarkable statement that he makes about disappointment. In fact, that term, cosmic disappointment, is a term that he writes about in Mere Christianity. Here's what he says. Read this. He says, the longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. And you might be thinking, yeah, but you're talking about the bad ones. He says, no, I'm not talking about what would ordinarily be called unsuccessful marriages or holidays or learned careers. I'm not talking about the vacation that doesn't line up with the picture on the map, right? Or doesn't line up with the picture on the website. I'm not talking about the bad marriage. I'm not talking about the broken career. I'm talking about the good ones. He says, I'm speaking of the best possible ones. He said, there was something that we grasped at, grasped at. And in that first moment of longing, it just fades away within the reality of, I didn't get what I was really looking for. And he said, there's two wrong ways and one right way to deal with this. And I'm just gonna paraphrase what he goes on to say. He says, here's one wrong way. This is what a lot of people do. When, when the thing that they're looking for, that they hope fulfills them, right? When it doesn't satisfy, it's real easy for us to blame and go, well, it's your fault. Maybe for some of you, that describes your first marriage. Somebody had these expectations and you just knew, I can't meet those. And they blamed you. It's your fault. Some of you blamed a boss. You ever been to a really nice resort? Like my wife and I have been to like maybe one or two. And it's wild. Whenever you go to these places, like I remember the one we went to for our, it was like our 15th wedding anniversary. It's the nicest place we'd ever been to. It's the best vacation we've ever been on. And I remember being in this resort. And I remember us being like, this is paradise. And at the same time of me thinking that, I saw this one couple standing at the desk, just, I mean, livid, just yelling at the people that work there, like about to come over the counter, right? And I was just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how is this the best for us and such a disappointment for you? We, we, we've all seen people who have experienced disappointment at stuff that we would have thought, oh, that seems really awesome. And what it reminds me of is it reminds me that in life, this is a crass way to say it, but hang with me on this. Everything in life ultimately can disappoint. And in life, it's almost as if we go to bed with Rachel and we wake up with Leah. In, in almost every category, every facet, every situation. We go to bed thinking, this is the thing that's gonna meet all my needs. This is the thing that's gonna fulfill me. And then we wake up realizing, nah, just didn't do it. So what do we do? He said, we can blame other people. He said, you can also just blame yourself. Live in shame, live in embarrassment, feel like I was a fool, I was an idiot, what's my problem? Or, he says, we can allow the disappointment to be a whisper from heaven reminding us that we were not made for this world which I know when you're at the desk at the hotel yelling at them because the room's not what you wanted it to be, 
that doesn't make you feel better, you know, to be like, you know what, I'm gonna take a step back here. I'm gonna allow this to be a whisper from heaven reminding me that I was not made for this world. That way, I, I get it. In the moment, it doesn't emotionally satisfy. But what if, what if next time that disappointment hit you, next time that broken dream slapped you in the face, next time you bumped into that, the sadness of unfulfillment, what if you reminded yourself This is just a whisper from heaven reminding me that I was not made for this world. And this world was not made to satisfy me. I was made to be in a relationship with God. And ultimately, he's the only one that can. Ultimately, he's the only one that can make you feel fulfilled and satisfied and filled with joy and content. He's the only one. So then what does he do? Let me ask you this question, second question. What does God do when we put something else or someone else in his place? What does he do? Well, there's a couple places we can look, right? You remember the story of Hosea and Gomer in the Old Testament? This is another bizarre story. God comes to Hosea. Hosea was a prophet of God. He comes to Hosea and he goes, Hosea, I want you to marry Gomer. And Hosea goes, Gomer? Gomer was was a prostitute. She was a woman of the night. I don't know that she wanted to do that, but her life circumstances had led her to the point where that was her option. But needless to say, she was not at the top of the social chain. And Hosea's going, you want me to marry Gomer? And God says to Hosea, yes, I want you to marry Gomer. And, Go, and Hosea is going, well, is she going to change? And God goes, for a little bit, but she's going to be unfaithful again. And I want you to stay with her even while she's unfaithful. And Hosea is going, this is mind-blowing. This makes no sense. And God tells Hosea, he says, the reason why I want you to do this is because I want to show my people what I do when they go and love other things. I want to show my people the way I wait for them, even when they go off and love other things. See, some of you are in a season right now, maybe, where you're obsessed with something else. You know what God does? He just waits for you. He just patiently waits. You remember in the New Testament, that story of the prodigal son, right? The son that asked the dad for his inheritance so he could go off and blow all his money. You remember when he's coming back home? What does the father do? When he sees him, as soon as he sees him coming down the road, He runs out to him and he says, how dare you, you little punk. You went out and spent all my money and you think that you can just roll back in here like everything's normal again? Oh, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the real world and it doesn't work that way in my house. Get to work. Is that what he did? (laughs) No. No. God's trying to tell us, Jesus was trying to tell us, this is what the heart of the Father is. That though the Son had loved all this other stuff, as soon as he comes back home, the Father goes out and pursues him. And he wraps a coat around him and he kisses him on the cheek and he gives him the family ring. And he says, my son, I love you. I'm, you're home, I can't believe it. And the son's like, dad, stop. I gotta tell you my speech that I have prepared for you. And he goes, I don't even wanna hear it. Get get your party clothes on because we're throwing a party because you're back. That's what God does. When we love other things, God patiently waits on us and he passionately pursues us even still. Y'all, our God, can I say y'all? Our God is not like anyone else. No, he's unbelievable. The fact that that he allows us to go off and live Whatever way you want to live. But then when we come back, he says, I've been waiting on you. I love you. I have a place for you. I have a party to throw you. I'm for you. I'm with you. You're mine. Even when we love other things. Last question. Who do you relate to most in this story? I want you to just pick one person that you would go, I relate most to that person. I mean, let me give you some options. You got Jacob, right? Maybe you relate to Jacob. He's always striving, always manipulating, always looking for the next thing. Maybe you're living for the weekend, living for the next vacation. Maybe you're a serial dater, a serial vacationer, a serial 
employee and you're just bouncing from thing to thing, trying to find the person or trying to find the thing that's gonna make you happy, maybe today you go, I'm done. I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna turn to God and I'm gonna say, you're the only one that can fulfill me. Maybe you relate to Rachel. I never felt hot like that, so I don't necessarily relate to Rachel, but some of you might. Some of you are like, yeah, 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 I'm bad and bougie. Like, I know what it feels like to be Rachel. Some of you, you, you got good looks. Some of you are super rich, and you've tasted like the best of life. Others of you are like, I would like to take that test. I would like to see what it would be like. But some of you could say, the problem with good looks The problem with a lot of money, the problem with a great job, the problem with a nice house, the problem with having a boat, the the problem is you don't really feel like you need God because you kind of got it all. And I bet Rachel probably felt the same way. She probably never really felt like she needed God until she bumped into the thing that she couldn't control. And maybe today that's you. Maybe today you go, I'm tired of living my life for myself. I'm going to submit to him, reach out to him and say, hey, I need you. I need you. And then maybe some of you relate to Leah. Leah was overlooked. Leah had to feel unloved. She had to feel taken advantage of, taken for granted. And everybody in the story maybe looked past Leah. But you got to know what our God is like. He didn't look past Leah. You know that out of everyone in this story, God honors Leah. That God holds Leah up and says, even though you might have felt unloved, or might have felt overlooked, I see you and I'm going to use you. See, she had a fourth child. Her fourth son, she named him Judah, which meant, I will praise you, my God. And somehow she made the shift of going, I'm not going to stare at Jacob anymore hoping that he fulfills me. I'm going to look to my God and praise him because he is the one that sees me and he's the one that hears me and he's the one that wants me and he's the one that I'm going to pursue because he's been pursuing me. And then the ultimate of the whole thing, this is amazing. The whole reason why we know so much about this story is because in the Old Testament, they're tracking the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, who was to come. And do you know the line of Jesus does not run through Rachel and her son, Joseph? You know where the line of Jesus runs in this story? It runs through Leah and her son, Judah. Is that not amazing that God would go, I'm going to hold up the weak to show off my strength. I'm going to hold up the broken to show off that I'm a healer. And I'm going to hold up the one who felt unloved to say that I am a lover. And so I'd love to pray for us today, and I'd love to pray for you. Would you mind bowing your head and closing your eyes? Father, I just pray that today that maybe somebody would see themselves the way you see them. That somebody would lay down the chase, they would lay down all of their striving, and they would say, I'm going to look to you. That, Father, if you brought Jesus from Leah, maybe that means that you could bring something out of my story. That, God, if anybody here feels overlooked or feels unloved, that they might realize that you are the God that holds up those who feel broken. And so maybe today somebody would look to you and turn to you. Somebody would reach out to you and say, I'm going to stop striving for something else or someone else, and I'm going to realize that I've got you, and if I have you, I've got everything. And God, I know for me, that would be a life-changing decision to continue to make over and over again. And so I pray that today would be a, a game changer. Today would be a moment of delineation for somebody, that they would see themselves the way you see them, and that they would see the beauty that we have in you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And thank God that we're not Bears fans. Amen.